thrilled to talk to you. This is something that I've been wanting to do for months and I'm glad that we were able to get this in the books and done. I have been following your work, your advocacy, your social media. Um, you are fearless. And um, we need people like you and the endo community who, who speak up for us when some of us don't feel like we can. When did you decide if there even was an active decision that you were going to be one of the loudest voices in the endo room about reproductive health? I don't think it was necessarily like a moment. It was really just me dealing with this on my own, having no clue what was going on with me, feeling completely isolated from friends, family. Like I wasn't talking to this about, you know, I wasn't talking about my pain with anyone. I wasn't talking about how sex was painful for me. I wasn't talking about how my periods laid me out for days on end every month. And I just like wrote about it one day because I was working at BuzzFeed, which is where I still am, but I was a writer at the time. And it was just something that was happening in my life that I couldn't really ignore. It felt like it was just like coming up for me continually. And so I decided to explore it. And after that, the feedback that I got like really lit a fire under me because I realized just how widespread this was, how much dis disinformation there is and how alone we all feel when, you know, we're not alone. So I just felt like I have this platform and I have an opportunity to talk about it. So I really felt like it was like my responsibility to do that. Mm -hmm. No, and, and you've done such a tremendous job with your platform, with your book. Congratulations on your book, by the way. It's a great read, Vagina Problems. Um, but you were alone in your journey for a long time before you ever came out publicly with your chronic illness. Um, tell me a little bit about that and how you were, what, 14 years old when this all started for you? Yeah, I think it took me a really long time to really grasp what I was going through. Um, it seemed very like sporadic and random when it first started happening. Like I would be overcome with such intense pain when I was running and I was very athletic in high school. I was on the basketball team. I ran track. I played tennis until I literally couldn't anymore because this pain kept coming up over and over again. And I would go to doctor after doctor and just no one seemed to be able to pinpoint what was happening. And I myself couldn't pinpoint it because it was pelvic pain. It was also like gastrointestinal issues. And then I would literally faint after running, like, because I was so overcome with pain in my abdomen. And so I just had no idea what was happening. And I kept going to doctors and just sort of being told, you know, what we all experience in your head, you're in high school, you're taking too many classes, you're worried about boys, like whatever it, no. it was to dismiss me. Right. Right. They came up with me. Yeah. So I, I just like sort of unintentionally took that in and didn't talk about it because every time I had tried to, I was shut down. And so I really, it took me like several years. I feel like just now at age almost 30, I'm really feeling like I can actually discuss this without feeling like I have to be quiet or that I'm doing something wrong. Um, because for so long, I just like really didn't even know where to start. And once I realized that the, all of these issues were connected and that my pelvic pain was because of this and, you know, all of these different things, like I just couldn't not talk about it because it had impacted me in ways that I'm still figuring out and working through to this day, as I'm sure you understand. So um, yeah, you know, I look back on that time in my life now and just, I mean, I was so isolated and so alone and so scared and so sad and just like could not possibly imagine that I would ever have a life worth living. And so I think that's why I try to be so loud now is because I really want to be that voice for people and the voice that I didn't have or didn't have access to, to say, yeah, it really sucks and you're allowed to be upset about it, but your life can still go on and you can still have a life despite this. Were you able to find some hope or some kind of medical intervention that helped you during all of this? I honestly think what changed my life the most, um, two things, pelvic floor physical therapy, which I found out about back in like 2013 when I ended up at Mayo Clinic for severe vaginismus after having a laparoscopy surgery, which was ablation. 
I didn't know at the time. And it just caused a myriad of health issues, one of them being severe vaginismus. And I ended up at Mayo Clinic because I just had no idea what was wrong with me. And the fact that I had to go to Mayo Clinic to be told that I have pelvic pain is just like absolutely infuriating. But um, while I was there, they told me I should go to physical therapy. And I was just like, excuse me, what? Um, And going to pelvic floor physical therapy really helped me understand what was happening in my body and also gave me tools to sort of fight back against it. And in addition to that, discovering medical marijuana for me personally has been a game changer. Um, My body never seemed to respond to other either over-the-counter prescription painkillers. And I was still just like, if if it did help take the edge off pain, it would make me nauseous or make me want to throw up or just like a bunch of side effects. And one of the things I struggle with the most is getting an appetite. And so moving to Los Angeles in 2014 and discovering medical marijuana later that year has been life-changing for me. And I use it daily to this day to manage all of my symptoms, whether it's anxiety from being in pain or just to get an appetite. Um, So both of those things like have really been astronomical and just helpful for me in ways that I'm still like so grateful for. And I think that's, that's the glimmer of hope that anyone who's in chronic pain needs is some sort of feel of control or relief. It's like, okay, I'm in this pain now, but how can I mitigate it? How can I overcome it? Because otherwise when you're in that pain bubble, it's like all encompassing the world is doom and gloom because your body's, at least the way I describe it for myself, it's like my body and I are disconnected and I feel like it's taken over me. And I'm like, why are you doing this right now? Like, what did we break up? <laughs> What's going yeah, it's on? Very confusing to feel like you're at war with your own body because you're like, why would you want to hurt me? Um, so that's like very real. And I relate to that a lot. And I think um, trying to reframe that and see it as like my body's doing the best it can and it's fighting back alongside me. And I just have to like believe in it and know that it's it's doing this to protect me. Like when it guards me from sex and makes it painful, it believes that it's protecting me from further pain. And that sounds weird to like think of my body that way, but that's been really important for me to like vision, envision it that way. Um, as like, it's trying to protect me because like you just said, for the longest time, I was like, why is my body literally attacking me? Like it's, it's such a mind fuck for lack of a better term. Yeah. No, it, it totally is. And, and, and I think it's really easy to get depressed and to feel hopeless and totally alone. And that's why going back to having these public discourses and having people say like, Hey, me too. Like you're, you're not alone in this. In fact, if we all speak up as a chorus of voices together, we could probably get a lot more done. And because you have been you know, obviously very forthcoming and candid on social media, you're not always received well. There's, you know, in the world of social media, there's, I always say it's like the evil mistress. Sometimes it can be really great. And then other times like, oh, you just bit me. Um, And I've seen you take some some public slaps. Um, How has that been for you? Do do you ever feel like I'm done with this social media world? I don't want to be the voice anymore of this disease. Oh yeah. Like, quite often, honestly, um, can be a very, very toxic. I don't want to say it's a toxic community. I think it can just become toxic because there's so much pain and heartbreak and sometimes it's displaced and it obviously totally hurts my feelings and really gets to me when I feel like the people that I'm trying to fight for feel like I'm fighting against them, but I, I'm very confident in what I say. I'm very, like, I believe in the message that I'm preaching. And I really believe that like, I'm trying to do the best, like make the care inclusive and speak for all of us. And so I really believe that when people come for me, I will listen. And if it's a valid critique, I'm more than happy to take that in because I'm not perfect. But a lot of the times I really look at it as like, you're sort of displacing your anger onto me and I don't really deserve that. So I just try and like brush it off, honestly. And that's one thing that I've heard from several voices in the endo community that some feel like they don't want to say anything anymore because they're going to get negative feedback and their hearts in the right place. And, you know, I think everyone feels like, hey, I'm willing to learn and listen and have constructive criticism 
if it's warranted and makes sense, but just like attacking one another isn't helping us move along, moving forward in order to progress um, as a community. Yeah. Well, I think it like really absolves the people who are at fault for a lot of our issues. Like, for example, the doctors and surgeons in this community, I think they're often put on a pedestal and sort of treated like gods. Whereas like, you know, for what? For doing their job? Like that's what we should expect them to do. That's not something that they deserve our endless praise for doing. Um, and especially when they're doing so without accepting insurance or charging thousands of dollars, like to me, that's much more of an issue than someone sharing that they got a hysterectomy and someone else not agreeing with that, you know? Um, so I think it just like is almost a way to like distract from the real issues. And sometimes, you know, we're all living with so much pain. So I really just try and like, look at it as like, like I just said, like maybe there's just something more going on. They're having a really bad day whatever it may be, because I've been there and I've lashed out before, you know, I think we all have been. So I really try and just like, think of it from that perspective of like, you know, this is just a lot to deal with and that doesn't make it okay, but it's like just having that level of understanding is always important, I think. Yeah. And I, I think it's, it's coming to things with empathy for each other. Um, yeah. there's no, there's no perfect here. Uh, no one has all the answers. Even those of us who might've had the disease for a long time, mm -hmm. um, don't know it all. And the ones that are new to it don't know it all. And, and none of us are, are saying that we're, you know, disease doctors here or mm -hmm. surgeons. Um, it's, it's advocacy and awareness and trying to give one another support in really hard times. You mentioned about doctors um and trying to sort through i mean you've been through a lot in in 10 plus years of of this journey with this disease have you been recently let down by doctors or surgeons yes absolutely unfortunately i had excision surgery um a year ago january 28th 2020 so just a little over a year ago with how doctors. first, first oh. excision? It was my first excision, my second surgery, but the first one was ablation. So it was something that I had sort of been toying with for many, many years. But um, my first surgery, like I mentioned, caused a lot of post-surgery issues, um, things that I'm still not recovered from in terms of like pelvic floor issues. And my pain got way worse. So that really fucked with me for a really long time emotionally. And to get back to the place where I felt comfortable going to see another surgeon, despite knowing that it was a different procedure, despite knowing that it was a different surgeon, like that was really hard for me here and the way that we're treated as patients and the way that, you know, the amount of money that we have to fork out. Like I was able to spend $10,000 on a surgery because my grandpa died and left me money, which is an immense privilege, but the fact that that's what it took for me to get the surgery that I felt like I needed in order to live my life is like extremely problematic and not at all how this community should be. And it's like a very depressing and sobering thoughts, right? It's like a truck outside. Um, but basically what happened was I wasn't thrilled with the aftercare, felt like I had a lot of questions that weren't answered. And when I raised concerns about that, I was immediately dropped as a patient. Um, Wait, just you were dropped as a patient? Dropped as a patient. I received a letter in the mail saying that she would no longer see me as a patient ever again and that I had X amount of days to get my records. Um, and this was just like completely out of the blue. Um, it really fucked with me in ways that I am still processing in therapy. And um, regardless of like what happened or like what went through, her mind or my mind is just like, the power that these surgeons have, we, we give them our lives and the quality of life or the quality of care is just not what it should be for the amount of power that they have. And I don't know if that makes sense, but it's just oh, it like, does. it does, it does make sense because I think as a patient for separate yourself from the disease, right? You're a person, they're yeah. a person. We all have expectations of each other. Yeah. And yet you're a person in a position of vulnerability and fragility where they're in a position of superiority, at least just from the power dynamic stance. Yeah. You don't have the answers. You want the answers. You're in pain. 
And a lot of them are really, really busy and yeah. have a big portfolio of patients and they cannot devote much more time than the first appointment, the surgery, the post-op. And then if you have questions, sorry. Yeah. And I'm not, and obviously there's, this is not generalizing all surgeons. There are some that are hands-on that will call you at all times of night. I've been very fortunate with surgeons like that. And I consider myself lucky. Um, but I have heard the stories like yours. Yeah. I think it's like more common than we think. And I think they get off scot free a lot of the time because they have this reputation and everyone talks about how they changed their life. So if you're the person like me that falls into that gray area of the excision surgery, not being this miracle that you were looking for and still having pain afterwards and not getting answers or getting dropped, you're just left to feel like, okay, I'm not a part of this community because I'm not feeling the way that everyone else says I should be feeling. I don't have anyone to turn to because this doctor completely cut me off. And so it's almost, I almost feel like I'm worse off now than I was going into the surgery, which is really hard to swallow because like I said, it took me so much to get to the point of even feeling comfortable to do that. And I don't regret having the surgery. I do think it was very helpful in a lot of ways, but um, I think that I went into it thinking that it would be more of a cure than it was for me. And I think that happens more than we think. Well, I think that the reality is that endo doesn't have a cure and that's, and that's a tough pill to swallow. And I think excision surgery has been the closest thing to living as pain-free of, of a life as we can. But I think there's a caveat to that of it doesn't always work. And that's what it's discussed about. Yeah. And that there's people that have multiple surgeries and it doesn't work and it comes back. And I know um, there's been discussions on reoperative endometriosis and, and for some people, the gold standard just doesn't, just doesn't work. Um, and that's, that's hard because again, we go back to that tunnel, right? It's like that, where's my light? Where am I going to get out of this? If I have a chronic illness and everyone's saying, well, you know, wait till you hit menopause. Really? Yeah that's the cure because we're also finding out from, from doctors that menopause isn't necessarily the cure either. Right. So it's like, so what is the prison sentence of this body? <laughs> if there's no real answer. And that's why for me, at least I've been committed to advocacy and awareness because I feel like without real change, mm -hmm. without change for, in terms of research and education, within the medical community and then even broader with the general population we're all just confined to these sentences of here are your very limited menu of options yeah. and if they don't work for you i'm not sure what to tell you yeah. sorry yeah yeah uh, i think quality of life gets left out of that conversation often too like when you talk about being put on a drug that forces early menopause it's like do do doctors think about like what that does to our life or what it could do to our life in terms of side effects? Um, I was put on such high doses of drugs, which again, impact everyone differently, but I've been going through withdrawals for the last seven months now. And that's been worse than most days with endometriosis. So I'm just like, I almost would have just like preferred to stay how I was. Um, sometimes I feel like the band-aids that they give us are just band-aids over bullet holes, right? And I'm still bleeding out and they just keep putting band-aids. And I'm like, at what point do we just take all these band-aids off and like start over? I don't know. Do you think that this, and I think this is kind of a theme that's been discussed, but we look at how much money they spend on erectile medicine, right? Here's women, individuals, anyone born with a uterus who's saying, hey, I've got a myriad of debilitating symptoms hey, doctor, hey, pharmaceutical company, hey, scientist, help us. And it seems like it's, oh, yeah, we hear you in the back, but we're yeah. going to help this drug for somebody who, you know, wants to have better sex. Yeah. I, I mean, absolutely. still in that archaic mindset for mm -hmm. women or individuals born with the uterus. Yeah. I think that honestly, what I've realized in the last year for me personally, is I used to think that doctors just didn't believe me. And now I just don't think that they care. Um, I think they believe that I'm in pain and I, you know, I can't speak for every doctor. I'm just speaking to the experiences that I've personally had, which is that 
when I get them to believe that what's happening, you know, they all know at this point what I'm dealing with. I have adenomyosis, I have endometriosis, a myriad of pelvic floor issues. That's not up for debate anymore. But what seems to be up for debate is whether or not I deserve to live a life without pain, whether or not I deserve to have pain free sex, orgasm without sex, all of these things that like, no one has ever really said like, oh, I'm really sorry that you aren't able to drink pop without, you know, your bladder feeling like it's going to be set on fire. I'm really sorry that you can't work as in without pain. Um, it always seems like they're just sort of like, again, back to the bandaid over a bullet hole. Whereas like when a man goes and has an issue, it's like, oh, you know, roll out the fucking red carpet, figure out how we can change this person's life for the better. And I feel like you just don't get that with people who are assigned female at birth. I also think it's tricky too, because there's a lot of, anytime I speak to someone with endo or any kind of chronic illness in this realm of reproductive health, which I know it's so much more than reproductive, um, but the response is always like, yeah, I wasn't believed for like 10 years, or I was told it was in my head. You said the same thing earlier on in our conversation Mm -hmm. and I'm diagnosed with endo, you know, biopsy proven, right? Like I think I've had, I can't even remember how many excisions four. Um, and, and at this point it's like, I still feel like sometimes I'm going crazy because I'm like, wait, but I'm in pain. 100% I know I'm in pain. 100% I know this isn't okay. Why am I always feeling like I have to convince? Totally. I mean, like you just said, I have to convince myself a lot of the time. Um, That's what medical gaslighting will do to you. And it really takes an emotional toll, like long-term to the point where, like you said, if I'm having a bad pain day, sometimes I literally don't feel like I deserve to get myself relief because I will sit there in my head and think about how I'm just being dramatic or anyone, everyone else is dealing with pain like this. Why can't I just deal with it better? Why am I being weak? That's coming from all of those doctors and those people who for so many years told me that in so many words, like, what are you upset about? Yeah. Sex is painful. Yeah. Your stomach hurts all the time. What what do you want me to do about it? And so I feel like now it's so hard to get myself to a place where A, I I believe that I deserve relief or B, that I even believe that I'm in pain at all, um, even though I know I'm in pain. It sounds right. so weird, but I know you get it. Yeah, no, no, I get it. And I think I think other people watching will get it too, because it's almost like we've been convinced it's like mind over matter. Mm-hmm. Like, because, because it's been considered a, an invisible disease, I've had people that have said to me so in so many ways, like, hey, you look fine. It's like, I don't feel fine. I feel like I was in a car accident. Right. Like, how is that helpful? How is that comforting? But, and I don't expect everyone to know the answers or understand or, or necessarily get people to say the right thing or react the right way. But when it comes from the medical community and you're just like, be- believe me, like you're already at 10 plus pain. That's why you're there in the first place. But then you want someone to believe you so that you can get an answer. I think once that's validated, there is like a deep breath, there's like a reprieve because you finally feel like, oh good, I, I my pain is validated. It's real. I don't have to fight this fight while fighting the pain. Right. And and that's just, I mean, we're we're getting into the emotions of all of it, but that in itself is just so <sighs> harrowing and disappointing. <laughs> it's odd to like crave a diagnosis, right? Like where you before I went in for my latest surgery, I was legitimately excited. Like I couldn't wait to be told what was wrong with me because I needed that validation. Mm -hmm. I was living in daily hell pain and I needed someone to tell me why or what the fuck was going on in my body. So I totally get that. It's just like weird to be like, please like, believe me, tell me something's wrong. Show me the pictures. Like I have pictures from my surgery framed because it's a reminder to me that like what I went through was very fucking real and um, was very painful and still is. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think anyone that dismisses pain or says they don't believe you on to the next. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Because whether it's a physician or a friend or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or whomever it might be, that's the last person that anyone dealing with 
a chronic illness needs in their life. No, yeah. I have zero patience for people like that. Medical professionals, people in my life at this point, if you don't get it, it's not my job to see you. Google exists. I have bled out in so many ways, I feel like sharing all of this. And I'm happy to do that for the people that have it, but for the people that, you know, have access and have able bodies and have the willpower and the resources to learn more about this, like do it. It's not my job. It's not your job either. You know, what's your advice for someone watching right now and saying, Oh, I hear what she's saying. I get it. I feel the same. I feel at a loss. How do you just keep going through it every month, every day? That's a good question. I think what's been really important for me is to allow myself the space to not keep going when I feel like I can't. Um, If I feel like I can't talk about it on a certain day or I feel like I just can't deal with it, then I won't. I will literally lay down in bed and watch 10 episodes in a row of Real Housewives if that's what I need. And I really try not to give myself any guilt about that. I think it's okay to surrender to the pain when you feel like you need to. And for me, it's been important to reframe it as surrendering and not giving up. Like it's an act that I am choosing. I'm saying, hey, I'm not feeling it today. I'm going to lay down. I'll come back to this later because I know I'm going to, right? But it's like just been really important for me to allow myself the space to give up. And I think that's something that we avoid a lot or, you know, avoid talking about because we don't want to be seen as like giving up is sort of equated as being a bad thing or like being really depressing. And I think it's just a reality that you're going to have days, weeks, maybe even months where you just feel like I can't go to physical therapy anymore. I can't go see this doctor for a while. And I think that's okay. Honestly, Um, it's been okay for me. And it's been really important for me to take breaks when I feel like I absolutely need to. That's no, that's great. I mean, that's great advice and something I've been struggling with that, especially in the COVID world where most of us are working from home there's this constant around the clock, like, oh, well, they're home. So I'm just going to call them at 10 o'clock and ask them a work question or drop something on their plate at seven o'clock at night. When in the old real world, we would have work hours and established. And, and I do think there's this pressure to overcompensate, overachieve. And when you're dealing with a chronic illness on top of that, you're not giving your body the time it needs to decompress, to heal, um, as you said, to surrender to the pain, because there's just times where it just grips you and and you can't really do more than that. And it's okay to be like, I'm simply human. Totally. Absolutely. Setting boundaries is so important. Work, friends, family, whatever it may be, that has been probably the most instrumental part of what I've learned in therapy in dealing with this chronic illness over the last five years is being able to say, Hey, you know what? I'm sick. I won't be checking emails. I'll let you know when I'm back. Um, and knowing that that's okay to do because you're sick, you know, like you can't, you can't be superhuman. You are who you are. You have what you have. And it's not a bad thing. It's just a reality. You can't work that day. You'll get back to it when you can. Yeah, no, that's, that's again, excellent advice. It's something that's hard to do because we have these pressures that are not only in our minds, but also put upon us whether it's in the workplace or family dynamics. Um, and I think that's, that's a tough one to, to grapple with and feel like it's okay to not feel okay. Absolutely. Yeah, it takes a lot of practice and it's something that I still have to practice all the time. Um, but I think not allowing myself to give myself an out, like I don't preface it with an apology anymore, which is a great privilege that I'm able to do that in my work. But I think it's important that if you do have that ability to not say, hey, I'm really sorry that I have to take a sick day. Because why should you be sorry? You're not doing anything wrong. And I noticed personally that when I sort of prefaced it with that, that I would already set me in the mindset of like, everyone's going to be mad at me. Everyone hates me. Whereas like, if I framed it as like, I'm sick, I'll be back when I'm back. It was like, whatever, you know, I didn't really give the space for people to be upset by it. Because in my opinion, there's nothing that they should be upset about. And like you said, you're given the privilege that you can do that in other workplaces. Some people might not be able to, and they might be listening to this this and saying, but I can't do that because I'll lose my job. Um, To that person, what advice do you give when you can take the rest, when you can take, take the minute at work to, 
to try to sit down, decompress, meditate, do what they need to do to try to find some resolve. Yeah, I would say that when you do have the space or the time to take that rest, to take it and to not berate yourself for doing so, because honestly, it is crucial that we living with this disease, give ourselves that space for our bodies to rest and recuperate, or ultimately we're going to pay the price in the long run for not, you know, our bodies have a way of telling us when we need to slow down. And, you know, I know that it's not always possible to listen to that, but if you can, please do, and don't give yourself a hard time over it. Well, thank you again for your openness for continuing to talk about this issue. Um, it's not going anywhere and we have to keep fighting for each other. Absolutely. Thank you as well. This has been amazing. So yeah. no, please come back because there's going to be so much more to discuss. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>